Good morning. I'm Sylvia Formenti. I have the privilege to uh, chair this interesting session on uh, uh, novel, novel rational checkpoint inhibitors. And there are also known checkpoint inhibitors included in, in this uh, session. Um, so I will have a few words of introduction. And uh, they are among the many challenges of current immunotherapy. Um, clearly uh, dear to me, since I am uh, interested in combining radiation with immunotherapy, is how to best combine radiation immunotherapy. And some of the presentation today will address at least um, in some form that issue. So the questions we have in that field is how to optimally sequence. And uh, more and more evidence is suggesting that immunotherapy should be considered in a neoadjuvant setting when the tumor is still on site. Then there are issues about the optimal dose of radiation and, of course, the best partnership and where radiation is the most useful when used with immunotherapy. And then today we will address also some um, important uh, new uh, developments in combining uh, checkpoints, so antikim one with or without PD-1 in solid tumors. And then really not a checkpoint but a growth factor targeting FLE3 mutation AML and uh, some important clinical data that uh, will have a big impact in the management of leukemia. So without too much uh, delay, I just want to briefly summarize the structure today is that there will be a presentation of uh, a, um, the research by in the first presenter is going to be Dr. Leidner from Providence Cancer Center, who's going to talk about neoadjuvant immunoradiotherapy in head and neck cancer. This phase one, one B study combining uh, SBRT with PD-1 before the surgical resection. And then the format is that the discussant has 10 minutes to uh, make points and discuss the paper. So after Dr. Leidner, we'll have uh, a, a presentation from Dr. Curigliano and co-workers from uh, Istituto Europeo Italiano uh, uh, di Oncologia um, in Milan, uh, from Italy, uh, showing uh, the data on the combination of uh, MBG453 uh, and spartalizumab, which is a dual blockade of TIM3 and uh, PD-1. Um, and the discussion will be Christine Chung from Moffitt uh, Cancer Center in Tampa. The next. Uh, speaker will be Dr. Pearl from the Abramson Cancer Center, University of Pennsylvania, will speak about uh, clitinib um, um, impact on the survival of patients with the three mutated acute, uh, rel you know, relapsed and refractory acute myeloid leukemia. So interference with this is a really very nice example of targeted therapy against FLE3, uh, mutation of FLE3 uh, site. And then finally, Dr. Fujiwara, uh, representing Okayama University in Tokyo, showing this uh, fascinating approach of combining um, uh, manipulation of telomerase with telomelizin through an oncovirus, uh, an oncolytic uh, virus, together with radiotherapy and esophageal cancer, still a big challenge uh, in the clinic. So I will stop here, and without any further hesitation, invite Dr. Leiner to come up. Welcome. Oh, I'm trying to open my disclosures. Okay, thank you. I'm I'm Ram Leidner from Providence in Oregon. I'd like to thank Dr. Fermenti and the organizers. I'll be talking to you about neoadjuvant uh, immunoradiotherapy, which we call NERT, uh, in head and neck cancer phase one results. The, the Mac mouse. Uh, so this is, this is a melanoma case I'd like to open with. A uh, patient has been struggling with melanoma for nearly a decade. In attempts to save uh, his arm, he received various treatments, including interferon, high-dose IL-2, uh, ipilimumab, uh, anti-CTLA-4, and radiation, 50-grade standard fractionation of 2-grade per fraction, and uh, hypofractionated 8 grade times 4, and, and in the end, the arm had to be amputated. In 2014, he got access to PD-1, uh, and that was started uh, three months into therapy. Uh, there was progression of a neck mass that you see there. 
uh, and uh, spine mass as well. Uh, furthest to the left, that received eight gray times two in the neck and eight gray times one in the spine. Nine months later, in the middle, you see complete eradication of disease. The rest of the PET scan was negative. And 33 months later, he remained in remission, uh, having been off of anti-PD-1 for 15 months. Uh, this is not a unique case. Uh, many others have described such cases. We've seen several others, and they got us to thinking about synergies between radiation and immunotherapy. Uh, the mechanisms for these synergies are legion. Uh, they are listed here. Uh, tumor antigen release, increased priming, tumor adjuvant release damps, deletion of energic regula and regulatory T cells, as well as activation of effector T cells, as well, and chemokine attraction, uh, antigen processing machinery and death receptor upregulation, and enhanced immune cell trafficking. Um, broadly speaking, when we think about deploying uh, these synergies in the clinic, uh, we, we think about two synergies. Synergy one has to do with systemic control, where radiation acting as an in situ vaccine, and as we know, Dr. Fomenti and, as, and Dr. Damaria have been leaders in this area, can prime an immune response that then propagates uh, distantly to eradicate unirradiated lesions, the abscopal effect. And there you see a, a diagram. Uh, demonstrating that. Uh, and I would say for Synergy 1, radiation is the spark, the immune system is the workhorse. Synergy 2 is opposite. This deals with local control. The backbone of the treatment is the radiation, which induces changes in the tumor environment and surviving cancer cells that can result in immune-mediated local clearance of residual disease. And so, in essence, the immune system is cleaning up. There's no abscopal effect, and you can see that demonstrated in the cartoon lower right. Uh, there, there, there's ample uh, preclinical animal data to support the importance of immunocompetence being critical to local control with radiotherapy. Here we have the uh, Lewis Lung model from um, uh, my partners at, at, in, at, at the Early Childs Research Institute, Michael Goff and Marco Crittenden. And you can see that um, in the middle graph, uh, you see outgrowth, you see have the first curve showing a, a control and a radiated lesion in the, in the furthest to the right, and when you deplete CD8 T cells, you lose that control with earlier outgrowth. But we don't need to rely on the mice. We have the same data in human. This is from Cleveland Clinic in 2015 in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, comparing immunocompetent uh, squamous cell carcinoma treated with radiation uh, versus immunosuppressed individuals receiving uh, various agents, including CELSEP, prednisone. Uh, tacrolimus and uh, serolimus, and you can see that local control, these are the local control curves following uh, curative radiation treatment. Uh, it's much worse in the immunosuppressed individuals, so clearly the immune system has a role to play. Uh, here is a time course experiment. This is in the um, PANCO2 model uh, with radiation at various dose, doses along the bottom. You have zero gray and red, four gray and orange, eight gray and yellow, 12 gray and green, 16 gray light blue, 20 gray and dark blue, and interferon gamma is a positive control in pink. Looking, and this, this is out to 72 hours. Looking in the top row for class one MHC, you see nice upregulation that is dose dependent. You can see the furthest to the upper right, the, the blue curve at 20 gray and interferon gamma as well. But if you look at FAST in the middle row, you see the same dose dependent radiation effect out to 72 hours with no effect of interferon gamma. So it's gamma independent. And PDL1 is like class one. You see nice upregulation that is also induced by gamma. Uh, here looking at, and we've seen that in other mouse models, as, including the KPC model. Here is the Mach 1 head and neck model, uh, generously provided by Ravi Upaluri. And we see a dose-dependent uh, radiation-induced uh, upregulation of FAST, NKG2D ligand, class 1, class 2. We see the same effects in the Mach 2 model and in essentially every mouse model we look at. Uh, we also see effector cell attracting chemokines that are upregulated in response to radiation. This is a dual flank experiment in the 4T1 model. Um, we have CCL2, CXCL10, interferon gamma, and IL12. Uh, in, in each graph, the first uh, column is a non-treated mouse. Uh, the middle column is the irradiated flank, and the last column is the opposite non-irradiated flank, and so you can see that radiation is essential for inducing these chemokines. So putting this all together when we consider local controls, what we call Synergy 2, uh, there's a rationale for combining PD-1 with uh, hypofractionated radiation. 
Radiation will immunogenically modulate the tumor microenvironment, attract effector cells, upregulate class one FAS, ICAM, and KG2D ligand on tumor cells, but it will also induce blockade through upregulation of PDL1, and so it's a logical next step to combine PD1 axis inhibition. Um, as far as disease choice, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma is a model disease, given that local failure and local toxicity are significant issues. Uh, PD-1 axis inhibition has shown efficacy in this disease. The combination may allow potential for radiation dose reduction, and neoadjuvant treatment may provide an ideal platform to tease out effects in the tissue uh, from this approach. Um, the use of SBRT and head and neck squamous cell carcinoma is fairly routine in the re-irradiation setting, but there's also evidence for use in the primary upfront setting. This table summarizes the reported cases in total 67, and uh, we see a local control rate at one year of 78% with this approach, and overall survival of 72% in individuals that received only SBRT as their primary treatment. Uh, so that brings us to the trial design. This was presented in January of 2018, over a year ago in San Francisco by Dr. Crittenden. Uh, and, and our co-investigators in the lower right are, include Brian Bell and Christine Young. Um, in this trial, I want to take some time on this slide. The uh, inclusion criteria are local regionally advanced head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, PD-1 in the orange spheres. Uh, nivolumab in this case at the two-week dose was given at 240 milligrams IV on week zero, followed on week one by um, SBRT over a five-day interval to, to GTV plus three millimeters. So this is really only to gross disease. Uh, the two cohorts that I'll present consisted of eight gray times five, given consecutive days Monday through Friday, and eight gray times three on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. A week later, the second dose of PD-1 on the two-day schedule, nivolumab, week four, the third dose, and then surgery at week six. Because we started at zero, the actual interval from the end of SBRT to surgery is a five-week window. Uh, following uh, surgery, uh, the protocol allowed for risk-adapted standard of care adjuvant therapy, which consists of observation, radiation or radiation plus or minus chemo, as well as the addition of nivolumab, 480 milligrams on the Q4 week schedule for three doses, a total of three months. Uh, tissue collection occurred at baseline. Immediately at the end of SBRT, a second tissue sample was taken, and that's, that turned out, I think, to be precious. And then it preoperatively, well, then the surgical specimen. Blood is, is uh, also collected at those same time points. You can see the arrows in red, as well as before SBRT and at the end and at the week four dosing of nivolumab and week 10 at the start of the adjuvant period. Uh, the primary endpoint of this study was safety. Uh, that was defined pragmatically as any unplanned delay in surgery. The secondary tissue endpoint was pathologic response in the surgical resection specimen. Uh, these are the patient ca characteristics, five patients per each of the two cohorts, eight grade times five and eight grade times three. In total, uh, 10 patients, all male, all HPV positive. You have the TNM scoring there. N1 in the AJCC, eighth edition, uh, can encompass a large number, a varying number of lymph nodes, and I'll show you the lymph node number shortly. The sites uh, were in the oropharynx, but there's also uh, three cases of unknown primary. What that means is HPB positive lymph nodes in the neck without an identifiable mucosal primary site, which is an established entity in this disease. Uh, so in cohort one, you see the patient demographics there, and I'll highlight in the last column are the number of nodes for each patient, ranging from two to three clinically involved nodes. It's a clinical staging system at this point, and two cases, the first and the fifth, of unknown primary site. The second uh, cohort is shown here. Again, uh, the number of nodes in the last column ranging from one to four clinically, and one case, number five, in this cohort of unknown primary site. These are the surgeries that were planned for these patients. For the unknown primary sites, routine surgery was unilateral neck dissection only. That's the first and fifth patient in the first cohort. For the, uh, the tonsil primary sites, it's a transoral robotic surgery plus unilateral neck dissection as standard of care. Uh, this is for the second cohort, again, TORS plus neck dissection for the first four and unilateral neck dissection only for the last patient. 
As far as the primary endpoint safety, we saw no delays in surgery. So we met the primary endpoint. There were no dose-limiting toxicities from neoadjuvant, sandwich, PD-1, and SBRT. The toxicities were mild. Um, we saw grade one and two mucositis. It resolved in all patients by week four at the time of the third nivolumab dose, in other words, uh, three weeks after the end of SBRT and well ahead of the week six surgery. Uh, as far as immune-related events, the standard pruritus rash and uh, rhinitis, grade one, and it's basically because we asked about it. What about re neoadjuvant response? Sorry about that. So by resist criteria, this is one of the cases, patient one in cohort two. You can see a tonsil primary in the neck nodes on the PET scan and the radiation plan in the upper right. This was rather bulky disease, and this patient had the, the largest decrement by, uh, by CT scans uh, pre and post. Here is the primary site. You can make out the primary tumor, a bulky tonsil mass, and uh, at the end of neoadjuvant treatment, it's resolved. Um, in the neck, we see bulky nodal disease, and that has somewhat diminished by the end of treatment. However, uh, when we went to surgery, uh, we found complete, uh, we found a, t a path complete response in the primary site, and residua of uh, cancer in the neck nodes uh, with less than 10% viable tumor cells and evidence of immune eradication. This is, uh, this is the overall picture we saw by radiographically. We saw, we saw no complete responses radiographically. We saw seven uh, partial responses, 70%, and stable disease in three patients, 30%. This is a second case. Uh, you can see, I think, in the upper left on the PET scan, the primary site in the lingual tonsil. This is the site uh, at the at baseline, and on CT scans post-treatment, we see very little change. Uh, likewise, in the neck, you can see a neck node, which is easier to see on the CT scan, I think, than the PET scan, and that did not change much at treatment. This was a case of stable disease radiographically. At surgery, we saw a pathologic complete response uh, in both the primary and the neck. Uh, and overall, what I'm about to show you is that we saw no correlation between uh, radiographic response and tissue response at surgery. Uh, so these are the responses we saw by resist radiographically. I won't belabor that point. In the first cohort, these are the surgical responses by final pathology. We saw complete response in all five patients at the eight grade times five dose. At the eight grade times three dose, we saw pathologic complete response in four out of five patients with the final patient, which I've just shown you, having a major pathological response of over 90%, meaning less than 10% uh, residual tumor cells. And so the, the secondary tissue endpoint far exceeded our expectations on this trial, I'll say in summary, when we were designing it. Uh, these are the changes that we see typically with an immune response in the tissue. Here we have an example of, um, of, of proliferative fibrosis with plasma cells. Here we have at low power the classic cholesterol clefts with the multinucleated foreign body giant cells. Here's the same at high power. And here is an example of uh, necrosis with a histiocytic reaction. Um, I want to talk about toxicity. As I said, in the neoadjuvant setting, we saw no toxicity. However, we did see significant delayed toxicity. Uh, this is a summary. There was no grade four delayed toxicity, but there was grade three delayed toxicity. Toxicity postoperatively was assessed using the Clavian-Dindo grading system, which is a, a validated postoperative scoring system, as well as CTCAE for things like endocrinopathy. We saw delayed mucosal healing following these surgeries. We did not see any delayed healing in the neck dissection, whether it was part of a a patient with a known primary or in the unknown primary cases that underwent neck dissection only. In fact, the patients that had neck dissection only had zero toxicity. All the toxicity had to do with delayed healing at the mucosal resection site. And I can speculate here, you know, healing at the mucosal site is by secondary intention. You don't suture up the mucosal site and it's a non-sterile environment. As opposed to the neck where you, healing is by primary intention and the, the field is basically sterile. Um, the delayed mucosal healing went on for months, which I'll show you in a moment. 
Uh, there was significant pain associated with that, up to grade three, which we defined as the requirement for opiates or more, at least uh, exceeding four weeks after, the, after surgery. Adrenal insufficiency in this setting was seen in, in five out of 10 cases, 50%, which far exceeds what we've, has been reported with nivolumab alone. And we saw thyroid dysfunction, which was not uh, surprising, actually. Uh, so here are, I want to talk about the onset of this toxicity. So I'm going to use two pragmatic indicators for this, uh, G-tube placement and the duration of tube feeding that was required, and then the duration of adrenal replacement in the cases of adrenal insufficiency with, glu uh, with corticosteroids. So the G-tube placement in the three cases in the, in the high dose, eight grade times five cohort, Realized these are the ones that had mucosal resection. It was not seen in the unknown neck dissection only. Uh, was it week 12, week 10, and week 22? The duration of tube feeding was six months, three months, and two months. So those weeks are weeks post-op, not weeks on study. So we're looking at three to however many months post-surgery that, that the anorexia and uh, non-healing mucosa required tube feeding. Uh, luckily, all of these patients were eventually able to wean from tube feeding. We saw none, there was no need for tube for two placement in the eight grade times three cohort. Uh, as far as adrenal insufficiency, the same three patients, and this is the duration of uh, corticosteroid replacement up to, in the third patient is ongoing but weaning as we speak. Uh, and two patients required um, replacement in the eight grade times three cohort. I've not shown you the, the time of onset for this because we were not uh, on the lookout for this complication initially and so I don't think we tested early enough. I think in the second cohort we did and it was surprising to see how early this onset after surgery. So this is a swimmer's plot of this toxicity, delayed toxicity pattern. We saw the green represents the neoadjuvant treatment phase, which lasted six weeks, and you have a demarcator for surgery there. Uh, the blue lines represent healing. Uh, orange is the use of opiates postoperatively. Uh, light orange. Dark orange is gastrostomy tube placement and tube feeding, and then healing after that. And purple is adrenal insufficiency. Here's the adrenal insufficiency, which occurred in the first cohort in the three patients that required mucosal resection at eight grade times five. Uh, and here is the second cohort. You can see the need for opiates uh, extending beyond four weeks in three out of the, the five patients in the second cohort and adrenal insufficiency in two out of five, which resolved basically when the, when the mucosa healed and the pain stopped. Uh, six months post-op is demarcated there. We have nearly six months follow-up on every patient. The median follow-up at this point is 10 months, and we've seen one recurrence. Surprisingly, in the high-dose cohort, uh, patient number three, uh, these are the baseline scans for that patient. Uh, you can see a tonsil primary and neck disease and the radiation plan there. This is baseline. I'm sorry that the Scan isn't showing up there, uh, but this patient did not have a major response by resist, although recall this is a pathologic complete response at surgery. Uh, the scans are missing, and that's, that's unfortunate. Uh, what I wanted to highlight here was that in the contralateral uh, right neck, there was a, a lymph node that did not meet size criteria and was not pet avid. However, by the time of surgery, if I can get this to work, that lymph node had been enlarging, and preoperatively we were suspicious, and we biopsied that lymph node with a, with a plan that if it came back positive, we would do a bilateral neck dissection. However, the biopsy was negative, and we proceeded after multidisciplinary review with a unilateral neck dissection, which, as I mentioned, was a pathologic complete response. Um, we followed that lymph node out at six months. This is supposed to be a PET scan that you can't see, but it's still not avid at six months. And at 12 months on a CT scan, oh, at the six months PET scan, it had decreased in size on the dedicated CT portion. At 12 months, however, it began to enlarge again. A repeat biopsy was performed. It was enlarging, and this time it came back positive for the same P16 positive uh, squamous cell carcinoma. The patient underwent uh, two weeks ago a contralateral salvage neck dissection. 38 nodes were removed. Only that node was involved, 18 millimeters, and no high-risk features. The patient's doing well. Uh, in that node uh, that we pulled out, in at least 15% of the involved tissue, we saw a brisk 
uh, immune reaction that we think coincides with the pattern of enlargement and decrement that we saw over the one-year course here, and the remaining 85% showed standard uh, recurrent cancer. Uh, looking at the blood uh, correlatives performed on this study, you see in the red arrows, again, the time points at which blood was taken. Um, we were very concerned about lymphopenia. We've shown in prior clinical trials, this is from pancreas, uh, comparing two serial cohorts with standard fractionation of radiation plus chemotherapy versus hypofractionated radiation at the bottom with chemotherapy, uh, that we can uh, eliminate lymphopenia using hypofractionated radiation. Uh, and the, the defect that's caused by standard fractionation of radiation does not appear to us to be due to lack of uh, cytokine support. Here you have data for IL-2, 7, and 15. We saw functionally intact cytokine signaling in the T cells following a conventional fractionation. And the differences in treatment volumes do not account for the lymphopenia differences we see. Those data are not shown. Um, these graphs did not show up, unfortunately, but... Um, how do I go backwards on this? Ah, there, yes, thank you. If you could see the invisible graphs, uh, what you would see here is that uh, survival curves and separating patients that during chemo radiation had lymphopenia below 500, an absolute lymphocyte count of 500 during or at the end of their treatment, completely separates the KM curves in every cancer you look at. The, the most striking difference is if you can imagine with me in the lower left in the head and neck cancer. Um, and so we know that lymphopenia correlates with bad outcome. Uh, causality has not been established. And so we were keen to look at that in this study. And sure enough, we saw that we did not, we essentially remained at an absolute lymphocyte count on the left above 1,000 throughout the course of the 10 weeks we monitored. Uh, in the middle there, you have the baseline and surgical blood specimens. You can see that up to the point of surgery, nearly all the patient, none of the patients were below an uh, absolute lymphocyte count of 500, and that's compared to a historical cohort of neoadjuvant treatment where you see ne nearly all of the patients develop lymphopenia. Uh, when we look at subsets in the blood, uh, this analysis is ongoing, but I'll say that uh, one of the interesting signals we're seeing is prolonged activation in the effector memory subsets, whether CD4 and CD8. And when we look at uh, COSTIM markers such as ICOS, Gitter, and OX40, we see upregulation that's sustained as well, and the potential for sequential combinatorial pairing uh, in the future is not lost on us. Um, looking at the tissue samples, we have uh, tissue at three time points, and as I alluded, I think that the end of radiation time point is probably the most precious. I say that because at that point, there's still cancer for us to look at. At the time of surgery, there's no cancer left. However, we're interested in remodeling of the contexture in the regression bed, and so this will be valuable tissue as well from the surgery. Uh, we are interrogating that by RNA-seq deconvolution with, M with uh, multiplex IHC as well, and TCR sequencing both in the blood and tandem tissue to look at remodeling effects. Uh, in conclusion, we've met the primary endpoint. This approach certainly was safe as far as uh, not preventing uh, definitive surgery. Uh, the potency was much greater than expected with a pathologic CR rate of 90% and a major response in 100% of patients. Uh, clinically, we're seeing substantially, as one might expect, substantially reduced xerostomia and agusia, but that was not formally measured, so I can't assert that today. Certainly, those uh, assessments will be baked into any future cohorts. Um, the lower toxicity profile in the A-gray times three court obviously favors this one for development. Uh, we need to establish the failure rate of a GTV plus minimal boundary three millimeter approach, and it may not be appropriate for every subsite in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, we have ongoing tissue studies, as I've said. I think we need to monitor out in the blood at least six months, uh, rather than the 10 week time point we said initially, given the delayed nature of toxicity, including serum cytokines. Uh, to learn about what's happening there. The mechanism for the 50% rate of adrenal insufficiency, which we saw, remains elusive to us, and I welcome any suggestions. Um, as I've said, it may, the difference there pro appears to be healing by secondary intention, and it remains for us to be seen in future HPV-negative cohorts if, if the use of a flap and healing by primary intention abrogates that effect. 
Um, so these are the future directions. We've completed two arms on this study. A third arm is open and enrolled the first of five patients, which will be HPV positive A gray alone, no neoadjuvant uh, nivolumab, in order to assess the effects of radiation by itself. And an HPV negative arm, A gray times three with, with uh, PD-1, uh, that is also open and one patient accrued, an oral cancer patient. Uh, there's also a multi-institutional phase two trial being planned and we welcome support. Uh, these are my acknowledgements. It's taken a large team of, uh, of folks at, the, at our institute to pull this off. Um, and most of all, thank you to our patients and your attention. To discuss his paper, now Dr. Christine Chung from uh, Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa. Thank you, welcome. How do I go to my slide? First, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to discuss this study. Um, my disclosure, oh, my disclosure was presented with Dr. Leitner's talk. So um, Dr. Leitner already discussed the importance of radiation therapy and effects of immune modulation. Um, so I decided to focus on putting this clinical trial in context of current standard of care and management of HPV positive patients. So head and neck cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. Within head and neck, there are five um, major sites. And one of the sites is oropharynx, and human papilloma virus infects that specific site compared to other sites. This is a picture of a patient with a tonsil cancer. As you can see, that he has mass at the back of his throat. And the reason why HPV infects mostly oropharynx is because there are this specialized tonsil tissue and HPV infects tonsillar epithelium. And HPV positive patients have a very good prognosis. This is an older study published in 2010 um, when HPV positive patients are treated with the chemo radiation. Three year overall survival is 32%, while HPV negative patients is only 57%. And with the newer studies, for the past 10 years, radiation therapy has improved significantly. The outcome is even better. So HPV positive patients with low risk and stage one and two, as um, studied in Dr. Leitner's study, two-year overall survival is 98.4% with the cisplatin and radiation therapy. So the bar of treatment goals in this patient population is very high. Not only you have to come up with the less toxic treatments, you have to do this without compromising survival, benchmarked with a radi uh, randomized clinical trial at 98% at two years for low-risk patients, or 85% at five years in overall HPV-positive patients. So there is a concerted effort within head and neck cancer research community to de-intensify some of these patients with a really low risk. There are four main modalities of cancer treatment, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, surgery, and immunotherapy. We try to manage these patients with single modality therapy if possible. So we have completed this Energy Head Neck 002, enrolling 280 patients. Control arm is radiation plus cisplatin, and experiment arm is radiation alone, dropping chemotherapy altogether, and this study should read up by end of next year. The other approach is transoral robotic surgery. So before the um, TORS, the morbidity of oropharyngeal cancer surgery was pretty significant because for the surgeons to get to the back of the throat, they used to have to split the mandible. But that, that was um, improved by minimally invasive surgery such as oral, uh, transoral robotic surgery. So ECOG 3311 basically used 
tours as the backbone of the treatment and personalize the adjuvant therapy based on pathologic staging of surgically excised tumor. So some of the patients with really low volume disease, we would not give radiation at all. They're done with the surgery alone. If they have high risk disease, we actually give higher dose of radiation therapy, 66 gray, with chemotherapy, that's a treatment intensification. The intermediate risk, the standard radiation, um, post-op radiation is a 60 gray, and we would actually de-escalate to 50 gray um, in, uh, after the randomization. So this study is supposed to read up by end of next year as well. We completed the enrollment. So there is significant effort within head neck community to de-intensify with safe treatments. So let's look at the study design um, that was just discussed. This is neoadjuvant immunoradiotherapy. So um, patients are getting immunotherapy and radiation therapy before the surgery, and also receive immunotherapy at the back end as an adjuvant. For some of the uh, people in this room who are not clinicians, I just wanted to clarify the difference between neoadjuvant stereotactic body radiation therapy versus adjuvant intensi intensity modulated radiation therapy. So neoadjuvant SBRT is given before the surgery. You're given larger dose of radiation per fraction, 8 gray, and you're giving it to all patients before the surgery. But you only treat the gross disease that is seen on the CT scan. So you are giving less radiation to the normal tissue, but you may miss microscopic disease undetected by the imaging studies because imaging studies are not perfect. It would not pick up very small disease, which will inevitably grow after the surgery. And the main concern is the delay in wound healing after the surgery. Just radiated tissue does not heal as well as normal tissue. Adjuvant uh, IMRT is given after the surgery, and you are giving standard fractionation, which is a smaller dose of radiation per fraction, which is a two gray, and only patients considered at risk for recurrence would get the radiation therapy, meaning some of the patients who had a surgery with a low risk do not need any more treatment. And you treat the tumor bed and a larger area, area around it to cover the microscopic disease. And if your tumor volume is larger than expected or it's encroaching the midline, you would treat the contralateral neck as a prophylaxis because sometimes cancer will migrate to the other side of the neck and includes more normal tissue, although it's at a lower dose. And you don't have to worry about wound healing because you're giving the radiation after surgical wound is healed. So there is a significant difference whether you give radiation before the surgery or after the surgery, whether you give SBRT or IMRT. So it makes me wonder, um, is adding new adjuvant new, um, nivolumab and radiation and adjuvant nivolumab to patients with already resectable cancer with an extremely high cure rate considered deintensification. It's gaining the other toxicities to prevent lymphopenia justified. So anything you're adding to the backbone of the treatment, which is the surgery, it has to be justified. It has to show safety and it has to show efficacy. So let's look at the radiation dose. So the standard of um, giving two gray, so adjuvant treatment is a two gray uh, with, in, with a 30 fractions, so total dose of radiation is a 60 gray. When you give a larger dose, it's not one-to-one -one conversion. So if you give total of 40 gray in eight fractions, um, eight grays in five fractions, the equivalent dose given by two gray is a 60. So you are giving same dose of radiation. You're not giving any less before the surgery compared to the after surgery. So the tumor, the mucosa gets the same amount of radiation. But concern with SBRT is this exposure of higher radiation to the normal tissue, mostly neural and vascular. It's actually higher than when you give smaller dose, more um, longer period of the time after the surgery. 
So there is a significant concern of late toxicity because you see mostly acute toxicity with the mucosal exposure and you see late toxicity with the normal tissue. So late toxicity usually happens between six to 12, um, 12 months and you can see soft tissue bone necrosis, um, you can get pain and dysphagia and, and neuronal damages. So. Um, the rate of a feeding tube replacement is a good reflection of the late toxicity because you have to put the tube in because of the pain and difficult time swallowing. Um, so the other side of it is you have, um, if you de-escalate with three fractions, then compared to de-escalation of adjuvant, um, 50 gray, which was in our 3311 trial, it's actually, um, you're giving lower radiation to the tumor bed, although the amount of normal toxicity would be similar. Now the concern is de-escalation de would compromise the outcome. So if you look at the toxicities, as Dr. Leitner already mentioned, um, there is a high rate of feeding tube and wound healing issue in the mucosal surface. Um, if you give adjuvant cisplatin RT, feeding tube rate is 10 to 18% in um, concurrent chemo radiation. And how about nivolumab? So the response rate of HPP positive uh, to single agent nivolumab is about 16%. And there was a neoadjuvant nivolumab um, presented last uh, two years ago, just to give two doses before the surgery. It was just safe. It did not um, cause a delay in surgery, but path, path PR was not reported, but it show showed a significant shrinkage. So it may be single agent um, immunotherapy may be uh, quite effective in HPV positive patients. Um, but the concern is the adrenal insufficiency. Um, if you look at the literature, PD-1 monotherapy, it's very rare and reported to be about 0.6%, but in this study, we're seeing 40 to 60%, so this is a significant concern. So how about um, abscopal effect? In this study, um, presented last year at ASCO, metastatic patients received nivolumab alone or nivolumab with SBRT and Unreirradiated -re lesions were followed, and there was no difference in overall uh, response rate, no evidence of beneficial epscopal effect in head and neck cancer, but there was this interaction, suggestion of interaction. HPV positive patients where they got NEVO alone, there was 50% response rate, but NEVO plus SBRT was actually lower, 23%, while HPV negative patients' response rate was 8.3% NEVO alone, but 28% given SBRT which makes me question would the efficacy of adjuvant NEVO for three months be different because the patient had a neoadjuvant SBRT and NEVO. And they looked at the peripheral T-cell phenotype um, in patients who got NEVO SBRT with stable disease or progressive disease rather than response had increased, most significant increase in Treg population and TIM3 positive CD8 T-cell population. So um, overall, uh, toxicities of the neoadjuvant combination are, appears to be a major concern, needs a long-term follow-up, and I know Dr. Leitner is gonna study a lower cohort. Um, overall, PATH-CR already resectable patients in extreme high cure rate uh, may not be clinically meaningful. The role of adjuvant nivolumab after the neoadjuvant RT plus NEVO and surgery is unclear in HPV positive patients. The approach may be more suitable for HPV negative patients with a poor prognosis and in need of treatment intensities, and we eagerly wait the results of the biomarker studies and HPV negative cohort data. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. All right. I will invite the speakers to stay on their allocated time if we want to manage to conclude today. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Quigliano from uh, Italy, and let me see if I can get your speech up. Here we are. Thank you. Welcome. 
Thank you very much. So on behalf of my co-authors, I would like to thank Dr. Silvia Formenti and the organizing committee for uh, selecting our abstract. These are my disclosure, together with the disclosure of the discussant. So it's really a pleasure to present the first data of the phase one to study of MBG 453 plus partalizumab, PDR001, in patients with advanced malignancies. Team three, you know very well, is an inhibitory receptor with a key role in innate immunity. During this AACR, many presentations have been discussed about team three. It is broadly expressed on myeloid cells, plays a key role on antigen and cross-presenting dendritic cells, and is highly expressed on leukemic stem cells in acute myeloid leukemia. So is a potential important target to be combined with an anti-PD-1. MBG453 is a humanized IgG4 TIM3 monoclonal antibody that is able to block the interaction between TIM3 and this ligand, phosphatidylserine. It's quite important to remember that we may have also other specific target or ligand for TIM3. One of these may be also carcinoembryonic antigen binding domain, and the second one can be also homologous box recombinant one. TIM3 blockade may restore effector T cell activity to promote anti-tumor immunity by altering myeloid cells in tumor microenvironment. PDR001, spartalizumab, is an anti-PD1 that may block the interaction between PD1 and the ligand PDL1, PDL2 to restore effector T cell function. There is a strong rationale to combine an anti-TIM3 and an anti-PD-1. These are finally preclinical data coming from syngenic models of colorectal cancer. And as you can see over here, when you treat the mouse with the anti-TIM3 alone or with the anti-PD-1 alone, finally, you don't have the same activity of the combination with the a significant decrease in mean tumor sites when combining anti-PD-1 and anti-TIM3. On the other slide, you can see clinical data in patients receiving a previous treatment with anti-PD-1. These are data from patients treated with nivolumab, melanoma patient, and nosmo cell lung cancer patients. They both had a response when treated with NIVO and then progress it. And when you test the TIM3 expression on CD4 and CD8 following progression, you have an upregulation of TIM3. So that's why we decided to conduct a phase one trial combining an anti-PD-1 and an anti-TIM3. There is a strong preclinical rationale. MBG 453, pharmacodynamically can really block TIM3 IG binding to phosphodiethylserine. And uh, if you look here at the data of mean fluorescence intensity, there is a dramatically decrease on mean fluorescence intensity of TIM3. So it's an high affinity monoclonal antibody. This is the phase one study, MBG 453X 2001 is a phase one, 1B one trial with two cohorts. In one cohort, we have uh, the monotherapy MBG 453 with a dose escalation from 80 milligram to 1,200 milligram, administered every two weeks and every four weeks. In the second cohort, we have a dose escalation of the anti-TIM3 in combination with spartalizumab. The primary endpoint of the phase one study was the recommended phase two dose and the maximum tolerated dose. And here we will present the data of safety, 
of activity, and of course, the PK and APD data. These are the key inclusion criteria. Older patients with advanced metastatic solid tumors, so you will see we will have also an enrichment for rare disease. Measurable or non-measurable disease, according to RACIST uh, version 1.1. Most importantly, patient may have received an anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-1 treatment. So this is a very important cohort in our study because the rationale of the study is to overcome resistance of a previous immunocheckpoint inhibitors treatment. Performance status was zero two. We excluded from our trial symptomatic or untreated CNS meds or CNS meds that require, uh, require local treatment or increasing doses of steroids. We also excluded patients with significant cardiac disease or patients with active or history of autoimmune disease. These are the patient's demographics and characteristics. This is the largest trial, phase one trial, combining an anti-TIM3 with an anti-PD-1. It's quite important because we have some data from other compounds, but in the other trials, they don't have these numbers. The median age of the patients was uh, between uh, 58 and 61 years old. Uh, the patients are very well balanced, uh, uh, female and male. Most of the patients had a performance status 0-1. And finally, most importantly, we have, in the context of a clinical trial, 11 patients treated with an anti-PD-1 in the single agent cohort and 21 patients pretreated with an anti-PD-1 in the combination cohort. We also have one patient in the single agent arm with a prior PDL1 and two patients in the combination arm with a prior PDL1 treatment. These are the disease characteristics. So we have uh, the single agent and titanium 3 an enrichment for pancreatic cancer, then colorectal cancer, for some of them we know the date of microsatellite instability, cholangiocarcinoma, endometrial cancer, four breast cancer, of, uh, uh, three were triple negative breast cancer, and then no small cell lung cancer, sarcoma, glioblastoma, melanoma, ovarian carcinoma. In the combination arm, we have a uh, many colorectal cancer and non-small cell lung cancer, ovarian cancer again, hepatocellular carcinoma, melanoma, breast cancer, esophageal cancer, mesothelioma, renal cell cancer, small cell lung cancer, ureoterial carcinoma, and uveal melanoma. So it's really a large distribution of solid tumors. This is the patient disposition. So, Almost 90% of patients discontinued treatment due to progressive disease. We have still some patients ongoing. One patient in the single arm therapy out of 87, and then two patients in the combination arm with MBG 453 administered every two weeks. Nine patients with MBG 453 administered every four, four weeks. So across all the trial, one patient is still under treatment in the single agent treatment, and 11 patients under the combination. This is the pharmacokinetic of MBG 453. We have a similar PK exposure either as single agent, either in the combination with spartalizumab. What is quite interesting is that MBG 453 increase was approximately dose proportional from 240 to 1,200 milligram. At lower dose, you don't have a linear pharmacokinetic, so you need higher dose. It's not an high dose. Also, in similar in titanium 3 we have exactly the same range of doses. We have a low to moderate accumulation of MBG 453 with the median half-life that ranged from five days at lower dose 
to 16 days at higher dose. Usually the shorter half-life was observed in lower doses. These are very nice data of pharmacodynamics. So we assessed the levels of soluble TIM3. And uh, you can see that at lower dose, you have an up and down of the soluble TIM3. Once you increase the dose, you have a plateau. So based on this pharmacokinetic data, circulating soluble TIM3 and modeling of intratumular TIM3, we define it as the recommended phase two doses declared, MBG 800 milligrams every four weeks, 600 milligrams every three weeks, and 400 milligrams every two weeks, both as single agent or in combination with spartalizumab dosed at 400 milligram every four weeks. What's about safety? So overall, the combination was very safe. We included almost 170 patients. We observed them for a lot of time. Some of them received the previous immunocheckpoint treatment. Fatigue was the most common toxicity, either grade one or grade two. We observed the grade three fatigue, transaminitis, and the hyperglycemia, and we had one death due to myasthenia gravis, grade four, that was reported in a patient with timoma. So one patient died due to this uh, serious adverse event. But overall, the combination was very well tolerated. What's about the clinical benefit? No complete response was observed. We observed four partial response in the combination of antitim-3 plus partalizumab. We observed 24 stable disease in the antitim-3 monotherapy arm and 34 stable disease in the antitim-3 plus anti-PD-1 combination arm. So a lot of patients with stable disease and just 4.7% of partial response. Consider that almost all of these patients were heavily pretreated with several lines of chemotherapy, and there was no limitation for the lines of chemotherapy in the phase one dose escalation. So uh, I believe that is clinically relevant. What's about the type of stable disease? This is the single agent and titan three. So you can see the dot in yellow are patients with stable disease. And we have a long-term stable disease of almost one year in an ovarian cancer. Then also in patients with colorectal cancer and sarcoma and with endometrial cancer. If we go to the combination of antitim-3 plus partalizumab in, uh, in uh, in yellow, you will see again the stable disease, and then in red, the partial response. And we have some patients who had the partial response. A small cell lung cancer, previously treated with chemotherapy. Then we have a no small cell lung cancer, previously exposed to anti PD1 treatment. And of course, we have also some patients with non cutaneous melanoma and with endometrial cancer. And we have also a, an activity in patients with colorectal cancer. One of them was a microsatellite unstable. So long-term duration of clinical benefit. Few partial response, but many stable disease. This is a patient case, a 44 years old woman, former smoker with a stage four nosmo cell lung cancer. No mutation for epidermal growth factor receptor, no translocation for Rose and Dalk. She received the first line chemotherapy, standard of care, then a second line with nivolumab, and then was dosed with the lower dose of anti TIM3 plus PDR001. Look, we assessed the TIM3 overexpression because for all patients was mandatory the biopsy. We also assessed PDL1, LAG3. And here you can see a response in this patient. Since biopsy was mandatory for all patients, we performed the baseline biopsy and the biopsy at re-evaluation of disease. It's interesting here that you have in the patient 
that received the combination of anti-TIM3 plus anti-PD1, you have an upregulation of interferon gamma signature that you know very well is associated to immune response. So this is a, a piece of information of translational research. I believe it's, it's quite important. We don't have the TIM3 assessment on peripheral cells because we did not assess at flow cytometry in these patients. But this is a very interesting information. So in conclusion, single agent MBG 453 and the, the same single agent in combination with spartalizumab was very well tolerated in patients with advanced solid tumors. The recommended phase two doses were declared as MBG 453, 800 milligrams every four weeks, or 600 milligrams every three, or 400 milligrams every two weeks, both as single agent or in combination with spartalizumab at the dose of 400 milligrams every four weeks. The MBG 453 concentrations increased in an approximately dose proportional manner from 240 to 1,200 milligram. At lower dose, we observed a shorter half-life, and uh, at higher dose, we observed an half-life of 16 days. We also observed preliminary signs of anti-tumor activity, including in patients pretreated with anti-PD-1 and anti-PDL1, enrolled in the trial of the combination of the anti-TIM3 plus spartalizumab. We have RNA sick data and we observed a trend for increased expression of the interferon gamma G signature following exposure to the anti-TIM3 plus the anti-PD1 when comparing the baseline biopsy to the biopsy assessed after the exposure. There is a phase two ongoing actually in patients with melanoma and nosmo cell lung cancer that progressed to previous anti-PD-1 and anti-PDL1 therapy. So I would like to thank all my co-authors. This is a huge effort of three years. A special thanks to Sabine Getz-Wheeler, Hayang San, Andrew Stein, and all the team at the European Institute of Oncology. Of course, a big thank also to Novartis Pharmaceutical Corporation and articulate science for supporting in the preparation of their slides. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm now inviting Dr. Hong from Okay, thank you, thank you all. Um, I'm Dave Hong from MD Anderson, not Christine Chung. <laughs> um, uh, here. Here we are. Back to. Okay. So these are my many disclosures. Okay, so, um, so thank you again for the, for the organizing committee for uh, asking me to discuss this very interesting abstract. <clears throat> These are my disclosures again. So um, I think what's interesting is, is that technology, whether it's IT technology, whether it's cancer drug technology, oftentimes follow a very similar evolutional cycle. So this is what's called the Gartner's Hype Cycle. This is a, is a, is a cycle that a consulting group in the Silicon Valley area has looked at at both uh, IT technology and computer technology. And they argue that there is kind of this pattern of all uh, technologies, that you have this technology trigger, you see a peak in inflated expectations, and then you realize that it doesn't meet those expectations, and then there's this trough of disillusionment, and then there's this slow understanding of um, uh, the nuances of that technology, and you get better at it, and then you reach this plateau of productivity. So 
I would argue that we have <laughs> approached that to some extent with immuno-oncology. Uh, we had this initial peak of excitement with way uh, beyond my years, interferon IL-2, and then we had this period of trough of disillusionment for many, many years until, obviously, uh, the discovery of uh, checkpoint inhibitors, ipilimumab, and then PD-1 and CAR-T. And I would argue now that we are now headed towards somewhat of a trough of disillusionment with IO-IO combinations. As many of you know, there are now close to 2,000 IO-IO combinations in clinical trials. And yet there have been, at this point, nothing incredibly dramatic. In fact, there's been some incredibly dramatic failures in our field. So, but I applaud all of the investigators and the sponsors who say, you know what, there is going to be something better. And so I applaud uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Kugliani and uh, his investigators on this uh, very interesting abstract. So as Dr. Kugliani mentioned, TIM3 is an important regulator of this innate immunity. And it's broadly expressed across multiple cells. And what we think is, at least the uh, uh, understanding, and there have now been close to uh, 20 papers looking at combinations and effect in cancer, is, is that one, TIM3 interacts with gal uh, galactin 9 to downregulate and cause dysfunctional T cells. Two, it is involved clearly in the T regs and the MDSCs to regulate those cells to suppress immune function. And lastly, in, with, uh, in conjunction with HMGB1, it also uh, uh, downregulates innate immunity. So it's not surprising that we now have eight TIM3s in the clinic. MBG453 was uh, the first of these, but there now have been now eight uh, ongoing. These are not just a list of ongoing trials, but the list of agents. Some of these are bispecifics. Uh, one has recently read out, which was the Lilly compound and Ascocitsi. I don't have those slides up here. But uh, clearly, there is a lot of interest in moving this forward. And it makes sense. I mean, uh, preclinically, we know that at least it seems like there is sound rationale for the combination of TIM3 and PD-1. And so we're going to talk today about this MBG453, which is this humanized IgG4 TIM3 antibody, along with uh, PDR001, which is uh, Novartis's anti-PD1, uh, similar to many of the PD1s already out there. So I think this slide is key, right? So this slide is the, the key hypothesis that Juliana mentioned that the trial was designed for. Could we bring about synergy with PD1 TIM3? Could we possibly overcome PD1 resistance with this combination? And so the design of the study, again, the lar as uh, uh, mentioned, the largest study to date of the TIM3 combinations. And it's important to point out, they did allow for PD-1 refractory and PD-1 refractory patients, both in the single agent and the, double, uh, and the combination trial. And I want to applaud the investigators and uh, the sponsor for really making real efforts to understand both the PK and the pharmacodynamics of this molecule. They, uh, they did some elegant experiments looking at soluble TIM3 and then trying to model that as to actual intratumoral levels of TIM3 in the tumor. So, so as Julian mentioned here, the adverse event profile was very low. It was very well tolerated. In fact, as single agent, you would argue this, is pro this may be a lot of just underlying, you know, uh, symptoms that patients had. And then you saw some increase in fatigue. But what you didn't see was a significant increase in immune-related toxicities. And so you wonder, is that because the drug is just really well tolerated, or is it because it's really having absolutely no effect? So uh, the clinical benefit slide is listed here. And I think it's important to note, as a single agent, there were no responses. There were some interesting stable disease. And again, in combination, the actual response rate was relatively low. 
So in the single agent, there were some interesting responses, and I would argue that, yes, this is a heavy uh, pre-treated population, but the actual stable disease factor, it, it depends on what tumor type you have, right? But they did have some interesting uh, caveats here. An ovarian cancer patient, my understanding this is an uh, uh, endometrial and a sarcoma patient that had prolonged stable disease in a heavily pretreated population. This is, the, uh, this is the PR patients in the, uh, and stable disease patients in the combination. And as you can note, there are two patients here. These are both colorectal patients who were partial responders. Both of them were not exposed to prior PD-1. One of them did have an MSI high, which suggests that they may have been just responded to the PDR001. The other patient did have MSS stable, which is also very interesting since many of the models, preclinical models, would suggest that TIM3 is upregulated in, in colorectal. This was a small cell lung cancer patient who also responded but was not previously exposed to PD-1. As we all know, there is some level of activity with PD-1 alone in small cell. And really, the proof of concept is in this one patient, this non-small cell lung cancer patient who did previously have a PD-1 uh, therapy and appears to have had a significant response. But let's take a look at the overall responders and the number of patients in each of those cohorts relative to whether or not they were exposed to PD-1, because this was the central hypothesis of the study, right? So in CRC patients, there were zero patients actually who actually had prior PD-1 or pd one Two out of the six of these patients did have a PR, but again, zero of them had prior pd one therapy. The small cell lung cancer patient, one out of the three patients, uh, uh, actually, sorry, actually of zero out of the three patients were actually, you know, one out of the three patients had PD-1, and one out of the three patients did respond, but it was not the patient who actually had prior pd one or PD-1 exposure. In the non-small cell lung cancer patients, there were five patients who were priorly exposed to PD-1 or pd one therapy, and one out of those five patients did have a response to the PD-1, uh, so to the combination. So if you look at the total number of patients who received prior PD or pd one it was a total of 4.3%. This is the patient, as uh, Julian mentioned here, and, and you can see that there is TIM3 expansion. We don't, and I think the data is still, they're still evaluating the data in the other lung cancer cohorts. Uh, but, you know, it does seem like there, at least in this one patient, there seems to be a proof of concept, but it begs to, uh, the question is, it uh, begs to be answered, what is happening in those other four patients who had prior PD-1 therapy? <clears throat> and again, uh, this data, I think, is still emerging because uh, they haven't finished the analysis of the interferon gamma. But again, this is, this is uh, well done, and I think the interferon gamma gene signature does seem to uh, suggest a trend, but obviously uh, the, uh, it's not statistically significant at this time. So, in conclusion, um, you know, I again applaud the applaud the uh, the investigators for running a very large phase one trial, and uh, very and and incorporating many uh, uh, good uh, solid elements into a phase one trial, including PD and PK. But I agree that the overall toxicity is low, but you have to question whether this is just a lack of true synergy with the combination. Secondly, it, it is not clear to me as to how much this TIM3 is really adding to the PD-1 inhibition. The proof of concept here, I would argue, is limited to this one patient in non-small cell lung who's progressed on prior PD-1. And again, the data also is, uh, here is given that the small numbers are included in the PD uh, analysis. There is an ongoing larger data set, but I would caution the sponsor and the investigators even if you see an up, perhaps an uptick in response, that before you move on to a large randomized phase three, that you would consider a smaller randomized phase two. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, trying to stay on time. I'm now inviting Dr. Pearl to join us. Now, I don't understand what they did. 
Okay. So I don't see. We need some help because you, you change the control here and it's not possible to launch his uh, speech anymore. So let's talk anymore. Let's see. Sorry, Dr. Joseph. <laughs> I have no idea how to. Please, can IT help us out because you changed the mouse and now it's impossible to launch it. Save from trying with double clicking. The mouse is in extended view, so just scroll to the other room, drag it to the to the other screen. Yep. Okay. There you go. Okay. Now it's movable. It's Before working. it couldn't move. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fermenti. Thank you to the organizers for allowing me to present our results uh, on behalf of all of the Admiral investigators. Final analysis from the phase three uh, gilteritinib uh, trial in relapsed refractory FLT3 mutated AML. Um, I want, because this is an immunotherapy session uh, and because there's been relatively few studies on AML presented. Uh, in this context, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the patient population of relapsed refractory uh, acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, AML is a highly aggressive cancer of hematopoietic cells, uh, which is initially quite chemotherapy sensitive, and ind indeed about 70% of patients initially diagnosed with AML will enter a complete remission with one or two cycles of intensive chemotherapy. However, while those patients can be cured with chemotherapy alone and sometimes bone marrow transplantation, if patients ever relapse or if they are un, uh, refractory to frontline induction chemotherapy and fail to enter complete remission, uh, survival is dismal in this disease. Uh, and indeed, uh, 40 to 70 percent of patients with AML uh, either relapse after prior chemotherapy or up to 40 percent will fail to enter an initial complete remission despite intensive chemotherapy. Uh, decades of clinical trials in this uh, population have failed to establish a preferred treatment modality in terms of a regimen that has predictable response rates or durable uh, survivals, and indeed durable survival really is only seen amongst the minority of patients who proceed to allogeneic stem cell transplantation. Uh, one example of uh, the many studies that's been done to look at uh, improving therapeutics for this population is shown on the right, where a novel drug failed to show an improvement in uh, survival compared to investigators' choice of salvage chemotherapy. And on this study, uh, investigators could choose one of several different treatment options, all of which worked effectively the same, none of which was a preferred strategy, and the new drug was no better. For this reason, it has become standard that investigators should have the option to choose whatever they feel is most appropriate for patients uh, in order to treat relapse uh, therapy, given that there's no preferred strategy for this group. Let me introduce uh, FLT3 as a therapeutic target. Uh, the biology of AML is heavily studied, and mutations in FLT3 occur both commonly and are thought to contribute significantly to disease pathogenesis. Uh, mutations in the films like tyrosine kinase 3 hematopoietic cytokine receptor occur in about 30 percent of patients with AML. Um, they are associated with leukocytosis and a clinically aggressive phenotype. These patients can have a very rapid tumor doubling time. The white blood cell count can double in 24 hours, not uncommonly. Uh, and there are two hotspots for mutation in the gene. Uh, FLT3 ITDs, or internal tandem duplications, uh, are the majority of mutations we see in FLT3, and these are associated with a high rate of relapse and a rapid rate of relapse. So patients who go into remission only stay in remission typically a matter of weeks to a few months. There's a second hotspot for mutations in the activation loop of the, of the tyrosine kinase domain, particularly at residue DA35. DA um, and while this is not as prognostically important as FLT3 ITD, it can be important in terms of resistance to certain drugs uh, sought to target FLT3. Um, so because FLT3 is a mutationally activated tyrosine kinase that is constitutively activated by these mutations and contributes to the growth of the uh, malignant cells, it obviously has been low-hanging fruit for drug development, but it's taken a very long time to develop optimized FLT3 inhibitors. 
Um, some of the earliest uh, developed drugs to target FLT3 were multi-kinase inhibitors, best example of which is mitostorin, which was recently approved for FLT3 mutated AML in combination with frontline chemotherapy. Mitostorin, like many of the multi-kinase inhibitors, was a FLT3 inhibitor more by accident than by design. Um, it's a relatively weak inhibitor of FLT3. As a single agent, it does not have significant single agent activity in the relapse refractory uh, setting. Uh, but in frontline chemotherapy, again, in patients with more chemotherapy sensitivity, uh, it improves the survival of patients treated with intensive donorubus and ARIS-C combinations. Now, I would note that multi-kinase inhibitors have been tested in the relapse and refractory setting, uh, and a drug very similar to mitostorin failed to improve survival in a setting where all patients received uh, intensive chemotherapy plus the FLT3 inhibitor. So again, if you add a multi-kinase inhibitor to frontline chemotherapy, we can see a survival improvement. We don't see that in the relapse refractory setting. And it's thought that part of the problem here is we don't see single agent efficacy because these drugs are multi-kinase inhibitors with a significant potential for off-target uh, toxicity and an inability to dose escalate to full inhibition of FLT3 kinase. So the search for more potent and more selective FLT3 inhibitors was on at this point. Uh, a few of the uh, drugs that have been developed in this uh, regard are serafinib and quizartinib. And I would note that uh, serafinib is a multi-kinase inhibitor, but more potent than other drugs in the group. And quizartinib is really the first drug select specifically uh, designed as a selective FLT3 inhibitor. It's quite potent against FLT3, as you can see here, much more so than mitostorin. Uh, and ser uh, serafinib and or quizartinib have significant clinical activity, either as single agents or in combination with chemotherapy in relapsed and refractory patients with FLT3 ITD mutations. But, what, but these drugs, like other FLT3 inhibitors, have limitations. And the limitations of these two drugs in particular is that they're type 2 inhibitors, which means they only bind to FLT3 in the inactive conformation and thus are subject to a number of resistance mutations that can develop in the FLT3 kinase. And this is indeed what we saw in clinical therapy with these drugs, was that the re response durations was, were unfortunately relatively short. Uh, and were limited by the treatment emergence of on-target resistance mutations, again at the activation loop in the tyrosine kinase domain at DA35. There have also been some side effects that were concerning for the development of both of these drugs, which I've listed here, and include QT prolongation, hand-foot syndrome, and GI toxicity, as well as my, my myelosuppression. So a need for an optimized FLT3 inhibitor that would be uh, effective both as a single agent and have relatively few side effects so it could be combined with chemotherapy was for, further sought beyond the development of these drugs. And giltaritinib essentially has been, uh, been uh, a drug that effectively uh, achieved all of the, the things that we wanted for a FLT3 inhibitor. It has clinical activity in vitro and in, in clinical care against FLT3 ITD and TKD mutations. Again, these mutations that emerge in, as resistance mutations against the, the type 2 inhibitors. It is a type 1 inhibitor, meaning it binds to the active and the inactive conformation of FLT3. Um, and as a single agent, uh, it uh, demonstrates single agent anti-leukemic activity, including complete remissions at doses that achieve full kinase inhibition, namely those of 80 milligrams and higher. And it's tolerable at a wide range of doses, allowing us to choose the dose of 120 milligrams as a starting dose, which can be escalated if needed for better leukemia control, or de-escalated if we run into toxicity issues. And in terms of toxicities, we did not see any cases of hand-foot syndrome and only limited potential for QT prolongation. We therefore set to, to test the efficacy of giltaritinib as a single agent in relapsed and refractory FLT3 mutated patients against best available therapy. And that is the design of the Admiral study, which I've shown on the next slide. So this phase three worldwide multicenter trial, which is the registration study for giltaritinib, uh, was designed to test single agent giltaritinib versus investigators' choice of chemotherapy. The key eligibility criteria I've shown on the left here, patients needed to be either relapsed after a prior CRC, which is a composite CR definition, which includes complete remissions, complete remissions with incomplete uh, hematologic recovery or incomplete platelet recovery, um, or patients who had never achieved remission with frontline chemotherapy. And here, frontline chemotherapy was design, uh, defined as up to two uh, intensive blocks or a single intensive, uh, excuse me, a single block uh, de, uh, designed to in induce remission for patients who were not candidates for intensive therapy. Uh, patients were allowed to have prior mitostorin or serafinib, but other FLT3 inhibitors, including giltaritinib, were prohibited. 
Importantly, because gilteritinib is a selective inhibitor of FLT3 and does not have clinical efficacy in patients with wild-type FLT3, patients enrolled in this study were required to have demonstration of a FLT3 mutation by PCR testing with a 5% allele frequency cutoff. Um, patients uh, used a central laboratory for determination of their eligibility, although patients with rapidly progressive disease could be enrolled based on local results but had to have a demonstrable mutation. Uh, we also had baseline uh, organ function requirements, including a normal QTCF by central EKG review. Patients who met eligibility were randomized two to one to either single agent gilteritinib or a pre randomization choice of one of four chemotherapy options, two of which were highly intensive MEC chemotherapy, the chemotherapy ingredients are shown here, or FLAG IDA, again shown here. And these were delivered for one to two cycles with a response assessment after the first cycle. Uh, Low-intensity chemotherapy for patients not considered uh, uh, induction candidates for intensive therapy were also on options for enrolled patients, but the choice had to be made prior to randomization. And randomization was stratified based on the intensity of the salvage regimen that would have been chosen, as well as prior therapy. Uh, patients were randomized uh, to uh, gilteritinib 2 to 1 or salvage chemotherapy, and patients could go on to transplant if deemed eligible by the treating institution. Those on the gilteritinib arm were allowed to resume gilteritinib after successful transplant engraftment if they were stable uh, with no evidence of uh, progressive disease uh, 30 to 90 days after transplantation. There was no crossover on the study from the chemo to the gilteritinib arm. The primary endpoint of this study was overall survival by its initial design, and this was maintained, and these are the data I will show you today. I will note, however, that during the course of the study, after meetings with the FDA, a co-primary endpoint was defined, which was the CR and CRH range, uh, which is the complete remission with partial hematologic recovery in the gilteritinib arm at an interim analysis that was pre-planned effectively as a futility assessment. We also added in the efficacy assessment at that point. But importantly, the study conduct was not uh, changed in any way based on the results of that uh, assessment at the interim analysis. So even if the result was positive and gilteritinib met a pre-specified response rate and had sufficient uh, uh, tolerability and evidence of clinical benefit, it could be used for a registration uh, submission, which ultimately did occur and the drug was approved. But that did not change the final analysis, which was event triggered when a certain number of survival events was uh, achieved. So the trial enrolled to completion, the event rate was triggered, and final analysis occurred in October of 2018. Secondary endpoints, key secondary endpoints I've shown here of EFS and CR rate. The uh, patient disposition on the trial I've shown on the next slide. I would note that there was a small number of patients who were not uh, uh, randomized to salvage chemotherapy but did not actually receive that therapy. This was 12% of the control arm. More than 99% of gilteritinib randomized patients received their uh, assigned drug. And at the time of final analysis, 38 uh, patients were still on gilteritinib. At the time of analysis of the study, there were no patients still on the chemotherapy arm. The safety analysis set, from which I'll show you toxicity data, consisted of patients who received at least one dose of their assigned therapy. Uh, the other data I will present for you are all intent to treat. The baseline characteristics are shown here. The median age on this study was typical for relapse refractory AML at 62 years. Uh, these were predominantly patients with intermediate risk karyotype because that's where FLT3 mutations are enriched. Uh, FLT3 ITD mutation was seen in 90% of enrolled patients, with 2% of patients having both FLT3 ITD and TKD mutations, and only 8% of patients having a TKD mutation alone. 82% of patients had had prior intensive chemotherapy that contained an anthracycline, and 20% of patients were relapsed after a prior transplant. 12% of patients had had a prior uh, FLT3 inhibitor, mitostorin, or serafinib. And the split between relapsed and refractory patients was 61% relapsed and 39% refractory. Uh, only 20% of patients uh, on the study overall had had a relapse later, uh, of the relapsed patients had had a relapse more than six months after initial remission. The remainder were relapsed less than six months. The response rates are shown on this slide, and for all protocol-defined metrics, uh, gilteritinib more than doubled response rate. This was true for CR, this was true for CRC, this was true for the combined CR and CRH endpoint, both at final analysis and also at interim analysis. The duration of therapy was substantially longer in the gilteritinib arm, which is important to recognize when looking at toxicity data for the trial. And the duration of remission was substantially longer in the gilteritinib arm at 11 months for patients who achieved either a CR or a CRH. 
versus 1.8 months for the chemotherapy arm. A higher uh, percentage of patients went to transplant from the gilteritinib arm than from the chemo arm at 26 versus 15 percent. And again, I would note that the only curative therapy for relapsed and refractory patients is the receipt of allogeneic transplant. This is the primary endpoint for the study. The overall survival was higher on the gilteritinib arm, and the hazard ratio for survival uh, uh, indicated a 36% reduction in the risk of mortality associated with gilteritinib therapy with a p-value two-sided of 0 0.0007. Median overall survivals for gilteritinib were 9.3 months versus 5.6 months for chemotherapy. The estimated one-year survivals were more than doubled by gilteritinib therapy, with 37% of patients alive at a year versus 17% with chemotherapy. If we look at subgroup analysis to see if there's an uh, identifiable group that particularly benefits from this, I would say across the board we see a, a general trend that gilteritinib improved outcome in ne nearly all subtypes uh, that we could define on the study. I want to drill down on a few things that have come up from both this study and other trials of FLT3 inhibitors. Uh, there was at least as much benefit in female patients as compared to male patients. This is not seen with all FLT3 inhibitors. Uh, patients who had FLT3 ITD mutation or FLT3 TKD mutation had similar point estimates for survival, um, although you will note a wider confidence interval in the TKD arm, which I'll show more in a minute. Uh, patients with prior FLT3 inhibitor, again, the point estimate favors gilteritinib, but again, a wide confidence interval due to the small number of patients treated. And I would say, in general, if we look at patients who were eligible for high intensity or low intensity, there's a consistent uh, uh, evidence of benefit for both of these groups. So the survival benefit you're seeing is not because we didn't enroll enough patients to, low, to high intensity therapy who could have been benefited by a more intensive approach. If patients were eligible for high intensity uh, therapy, they benefited from gilteritinib over it. And lastly, I would just point out that the uh, benefit in terms of survival was predominantly seen amongst the relapsed patients rather than the refractory patients. But again, uh, you should be careful with analysis of any subgroups uh, based on the sample sizes shown. I do want to uh, highlight the activity in the TKD positive patients here. We see similar response rates given smaller numbers. Again, the point estimates have a wide confidence interval, particularly in the comparisons to the chemotherapy arm. So while we can't say uh, robustly that gilteritinib is better than salvage chemotherapy for the TKD specifically, the limitation here is the fact that only 10 patients in the chemotherapy arm were treated uh, with, uh, who had a TKD and 21 in the gilteritinib arm. So we just don't have the robustness from the sample size numbers. But the magnitude of benefit appears to be consistent, um, as do the response rate. So this drug is active in TKD uh, positive patients and uh, to my eyes appears to confer clinical benefit. If we look at event-free survival, which again was a secondary endpoint on the study, we had a limitation in terms of how the event-free survival was defined in that we uh, defined event-free survival uh, uh, for this study as an event was uh, death, inability to reach CRC, or uh, progression of disease after prior CRC. And if uh, patients fail to reach CRC, the event was defined as occurring on the date of randomization. So that accounts for the steep drop right at the zero time point here on both arms amongst the patients who did not achieve CRC. Unfortunately, one problem with how we've defined this is that the patients uh, on the control arm had a large number of sensor marks. And when we looked at why that happened, it was predominantly because patients who achieved a response on the intensive chemotherapy arms entered the long-term follow-up period at that point and effectively were not available for events because we defined them using central pathology review. So what I'm showing you here is actually if we use any marker of progressive disease or an event, which included events that were collected during long-term follow-up. So here we've defined events as the three I've mentioned previously, as well as any progression of disease or initiation of new therapy to treat leukemia that occurred during long-term follow-up. And as you can see, gilteritinib here uh, more convincingly shows an improvement in event-free survival. I mentioned that transplant is the only known cure for patients with relapsed and refractory disease, but what is the effect of the drug in the absence of transplant conferring that benefit? Here we see the uh, overall survival uh, Kaplan-Meier curve when censored for transplant, uh, and you note that there is still at least as much, if not potentially more, benefit for gilteritinib in this setting, uh, with the hazard ratio uh, shown above. Uh, if we look at the patients who did go on to transplant, uh, remember that at 30 to 90 days, patients were eligible to restart gilteritinib, and a substantial number of patients actually did so. 
about two to one uh, resumed gilteritinib as shown here, 35 resuming versus 16 who did not resume. And recognizing that there are a number of reasons that patients would not resume their medications, such as concomitant transplant-related complications, it's notable that if we look at a landmark analysis taken right at the midpoint of that eligible period amongst patients who were not known to have relapsed by the day 60 time point, uh, there is better survival in the patients who resume gilteritinib suggesting that the benefit from transplant is not just transplant alone, but potentially restarting the drug in the maintenance context. Obviously, a randomized comparison would be better, but we did not have that in the design of the study. To talk about toxicity of this uh, drug, uh, in general, gilteritinib was very well tolerated and was administered in the outpatient setting in the absence of complications of leukemia. We did see complications of leukemia in the study, not infrequently. Patients would develop fevers or infections that required hospitalization, but relatively few other toxicities did require inpatient management or were associated with greater than grade three toxicities. Amongst the things that we did see were cytopenias uh, uh, in the gilteritinib arm, as well as generally asymptomatic LFT abnormalities that typically were grade one, two, rather than grade three. And note that these incidences of toxicity are for the entire study period, and that the drug exposure was more than four times longer in the gilteritinib arm than on the salvage chemotherapy arm. So in terms of making a fair comparison, while it looks like the incidence of many of these toxicities is greater for gilteritinib, the exposure is greater too. So on the next slide, I'll actually show you uh, a matched amount of time for exposure, and you can make up your own decisions as to what uh, we see in terms of the relative contribution of the, the therapies to toxicity. Uh, in terms of serious toxicity, we did see deaths that were largely related to infection. I've highlighted the most common uh, uh, grade five toxicities here. In terms of QT prolongation, which again has been a limitation with certain FLT3 inhibitors, this was uncommon with gilteritinib. Uh, prolonged QT of uh, uh, sufficient to require dose reduction only occurred in 2% of patients, and only a single patient had a uh, triplicate QTCF of, uh, that averaged more than 500 milliseconds at any time post baseline. With regard to the cytopenias in gilteritinib therapy, uh, yep, we, we know that the uh, drug can either increase transfusion burden or can be associated with transfusion independence. Transfusion independence developed in a substantial number of patients treated with gilteritinib. 80% of patients were transfusion dependent coming on study, and 35% of those patients converted to transfusion independence. 20% of patients were transfusion free at the time of study enrollment, and 59% of those patients maintained this transfusion independence. And that transfusion independence is defined as a two month period or 56 days, post baseline. To compare 30 day exposure uh, to either gilteritinib or salvage chemotherapy, the treatment emergent adverse events of all uh, grades are shown here. Um, and as you can see, uh, again, uh, cytopenias and LFT abnormalities are really the ones that we see that may be more common with gilteritinib. Uh, but in general, toxicity was quite manageable, and if anything, was a little bit better than what we saw with the chemotherapy arm. So in conclusion, single agent oral gilteritinib has improved response rate and survival compared with best available IV or injected chemotherapy in patients with relapsed refractory FLT3 mutated AML. Compared with salvage chemotherapy, we saw very tolerable toxicity of gilteritinib that allowed outpatient administration of the drug and lower toxicity during the first 30 days of therapy. A substantial number of patients treated with gilteritinib went on to transplant, more than a quarter of the treated population, and recognizing that 20% of these patients had already had a prior transplant. But the relative contribution of transplant to the observed survival benefit appears small given that we have a survival benefit when, survive, when uh, censored for transplant, and that the longest survival amongst the transplanted patients were those that resumed gilteritinib. In terms of activity in the TKD mutant population, we certainly see evidence of drug activity, uh, but we cannot make any robust con uh, comparisons across the two arms. In terms of clinical impact of these data, uh, this establishes a new standard of care for the treatment of relapse refractory uh, AML amongst FLT3 mutated patients. It's important to screen for FLT3 mutations. It is important to give those patients what has been proven to be superior to available therapy. Based on these data, we have a new standard of care. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my many collaborating uh, investigators. I would like to acknowledge the patients and their families for the courage to uh, participate in this important trial. I want to thank the sponsor for putting this study together, as well as Open Health Medical Communications for help with the slide presentation. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much. And thank you for keeping the time going and discussing this paper with Dr. Kadia from, there he is, hold on, let me just try to get, here it is, start, there we are. Thank you, Dr. Kadia. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to congratulate Dr. Pearl and colleagues for completing this important study and thank the organizers for allowing me to provide some background and context about the treatment of FLT3 mutated acute myeloid leukemia. Advances and greater accessibility of genetic sequencing in leukemia has led to the discovery of recurrent somatic mutations that play important roles in the biology of the disease and have revealed AML not as just one disease, but a heterogeneous group of diseases that need to be addressed individually. <clears throat> The FMS-like tyrosine kinase 3, or FLT3, is a receptor tyrosine kinase expressed on hematopoietic stem cells <clears throat> and plays an important role in their survival, proliferation, and differentiation. Activating mutations in FLT3 are among the most prevalent in AML, present in about 25% of patients overall, and about a third of patients with normal karyotype AML. Two main type of mutations exist. The internal tandem duplication, or ITDs, at the juxtamembrane domain, and the tyrosine kinase domain mutations, most commonly leading to the D835 substitution. Both of these lead to constitutive FLT3 signaling of downstream pathways, leading to inhibition of apoptosis and aberrant proliferation. FLT3 ITD mutations in newly diagnosed AML have been associated with higher rates of relapse, short remission durations, and poor overall survival, while the prognostic impact of TKD mutations is less clear. FLT3 IT mutation status has now been incorporated into the AML prognostic classification systems and is an indication for allogeneic stem cell transplant and first complete remission. The adverse impact of FLT3 IT mutation in the relapse setting is also distinctly adverse, associated with a significantly inferior overall survival compared to those with wild type FLT3 when using conventional chemotherapy. Furthermore, the ratio of mutant to wild type alleles has prognostic implications with higher allelic ratios predicting for worse clinical outcomes. Over the past decade, there has been considerable interest and strong rationale to develop TKIs of mutant FLT3 as targeted therapy in AML. A variety of inhibitors have been developed and entered clinical trials. These are multi-kinase inhibitors with varied spectrums of kinase inhibition, but each with potent FLT3 inhibitory activity. They can be categorized into two types based on their ability to interact with the active, or inactive conformation of the FLT3 receptor. Type 1 inhibitors can be effective in either, while type 2 inhibitors only in the inactive conformation. Practically speaking, type 1 inhibitors have demonstrated activity in AML with ITD or TKD mutations, while type 2 inhibitors have activity only in FLT3 ITD mutated AML, with the development of point mutations in the TKD being an important mechanism of escape and resistance. So we just heard the results of the ADMIRAL trial. In a very difficult setting where historically we have had low response rates and median survival in the range of just four to six months with conventional therapy, a single agent targeted therapy demonstrated a more than doubling of the composite response rate and a significant improvement in median survival of 9.3 months versus 5.6 months. Notably, 34% of these patients achieved a CRCRH, signifying a meaningful recovery of bone marrow function and presumably reduce transfusion requirements. The drug was very, very well tolerated, and the survival benefit was seen across most subgroups. 26% of patients went to allogeneic stem cell transplant, but the survival benefit was seen even when censoring for transplant. And while not randomized, there was also a suggestion of benefit after stem cell transplant when continuing gilteritinib. So now we have the first FLT3 inhibitor approved in the relapse setting. While this is an important addition to our armamentarium against AML, and the results are compelling, more work needs to be done and several questions remain. Since FLT3 inhibitor-based therapy is now standard in the front line, how will these results differ going forward in an era of prior FLT3 therapy? What other agents are currently in development in this setting? How do they compare? And where will they fit in our treatment paradigm? Is single agent therapy really the best approach in this setting? How do we develop combinations and can we bring this agent into the front line? I'll spend the next few minutes touching upon some of these points. So now that FLT3 inhibitor-based therapy is standard in the front line, most, if not all, patients with FLT3-mutated AML 
in the salvage setting will have had prior exposure to a FLT3 inhibitor. Only a small subset of patients in the ADMIRAL trial had prior FLT3 TK exposure. So will these results hold, and how can we improve on them? The phase three randomized ratify study compared seven plus three with or without the type one FLT3 inhibitor mitostorin in newly diagnosed patients with FLT3 mutated AML. The study demonstrated a statistically significant survival benefit for mitostorin with an absolute improvement in overall survival of 7% at four years. This led to the approval of mitostorin in the front line and is established at the standard of care in newly diagnosed FLT3 mutated patients. On the ADMIRAL study, only 12% of patients had prior exposure to FLT3 inhibitor-based therapy. And when looking closely at the subgroup analysis for patients who had prior FLT3 inhibitor, the survival benefit was less clear, although the subgroup is small and could account for the wide confidence interval. We recently looked retrospectively at the effect of prior FLT3 inhibitor exposure on response rates, whether as a single agent, as shown here, or in combination with chemotherapy. Exposure to a prior FLT3 inhibitor was associated with reduced response rates compared to those patients who are FLT3 inhibitor naive. The phase 1-2 chrysalis trial in relapsed AML provides specific results for gilteritinib, with CRC rates of 44% in TKA naive patients, down to 31% in those who had prior TKA with a FLT3 inhibitor. How this will translate into survival remains to be seen, but the combination therapy may help augment activity. Several other FLT3 inhibitors have been studied in the salvage setting. In addition to serafinib, which is used off-label for this indication, quizartinib is currently the furthest along in clinical development for relapsed and refractory AML. Quizartinib is a potent type 2 FLT3 inhibitor that has been studied in the salvage setting for FLT3 mutated patients as a single agent. The quantum R trial, which is depicted here, has a similar design to the ADMIRAL trial with a few differences. Patients with relapsed and refractory FLT3 mutated AML were randomized to single agent quizartinib versus salvage chemotherapy which in this case included intensive chemotherapy and lotus ARC, but unlike the ADMIRAL trial, did not include hypomethylene agents. Also unlike the gilteritinib study, relapsed AML patients in this trial were required to have a first CR duration of less than six months, connoting higher risk disease. Quizartinib was associated with a higher composite complete remission rate of 48% versus 27%, and a median response duration of 12 weeks compared to five weeks. The primary endpoint of that study was overall survival, and Quizartinib demonstrated a significant improvement in median overall survival of 6.2 months versus 4.7 months for the control arm, corresponding to a one-year overall survival rate of 27% versus 20%. These data are currently under review by the FDA for potential approval in this setting. So with the caveat of comparing two separate trials with distinct patient populations and different eligibility criteria, here are some of the response data. After sorting through all the different response criteria and trying to compare apples to apples, when it's probably actually apples to oranges, we see a similar rate of composite complete remission between the two studies, but a higher rate of complete remission seen with gilteritinib. Additionally, the rate of CRH, or complete remission with hematologic improvement, was 13% with gilteritinib, but not reported in the quantum R trial. How each of these agents will be implemented, whether the development of TKD mutations will differ among the two agents, and how will these agents combine with chemotherapy are some questions that remain to be answered. There's a general belief in AML therapy that most will benefit from combination chemotherapy or combination therapy rather than single agents. How do we best design gilteritinib-based combinations and can we bring this agent into the front line? Here are some examples of studies combining lower intensity chemotherapy with 5-azocytidine and different FLT3 inhibitors in relapsed and refractory AML. With each of these, the combination was found to be safe and on average produced higher response rates than the single agent FLT3 inhibitor. You can see from this slide, the pipeline of studies for new FLT3 inhibitors is robust and studies are underway. In addition to combinations with lower intensity therapy, they are study being studied with uh, more intensive or higher intensity chemotherapy in the front line, as well as non-chemotherapy based approaches, such as immune checkpoint inhibitors and the BCL2 inhibitor, venetoclax. A recent presentation from the American Society of Hematology meeting in December gave us a glimpse of the potential efficacy of gilteritinib combined with 7 plus 3 in newly diagnosed patients with FLT3 mutated AML. The investigators observed a complete remission rate of 90% and a composite remission rate of 100%. These data are exciting, but still early, and we await mature data. So in conclusion, 
Single agent oral gilteronib provides a compelling clinical benefit in patients with relapsed refractory FLT3 mutated AML and now represents the standard of care in this setting. Further defining the activity of gilteronib in patients who have had prior FLT3 inhibitors will be important. A combination strategy with the chemotherapy and non chemotherapy approaches may help to further improve outcomes. And implementing gilteronib in different settings, such as frontline or maintenance therapy or after stem cell transplant as well as how to properly sequence these FLT3 inhibitors need to be studied. And I thank you for your attention. Our next speaker is Dr. Fujiwara from University of Okawayama. Let's see if I can launch it. Here we are. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, for kind introduction. And I also would like to thank the ACR for providing me a chance to speak here. Uh, today, I'll be talking about the preclinical and uh, clinical studies uh, of our uh, oncolytic adenovirus in combination with uh, uh, radiotherapy for esophageal cancer uh, in vulnerable patients. Esophageal cancer is a seventh leading cause uh, of uh, uh, cancer-related deaths and affects more than 45,000 people across the world. It is classified into main histological type, including squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. Overall, five-year uh, survival rates remain poor, uh, regardless of its uh, histological type. Esophageal cancer increase in incidence with age peaking in the seventh and eighth decade of life. In general, elderly patients may have limit with their ability to tolerate uh, intensive treatment such as radical surgery or a definitive chemotherapy. So we developed a less invasive uh, oncolytic adenovirus uh, for uh, frail and elderly esophageal cancer patient. Uh, let me start uh, with what is terminus. Terminus is a ribonuclear protein, uh, ribonuclear protein enzyme that can add terminic repeats to the end of chromosomes. Most of, most of human tumors express terminus activity, but most of normal cells do not. Therefore, uh, terminus may be a good candidate for cancer target therapy. There are three major components of terminus protein complex. Among them, HTAT, human terminus reverse transcriptase expression is well associated with terminus activity. The upstream promoter sequence of HTAT uh, gene has been cloned and characterized. Uh, we decided to use HTAT promoter as a molecular switch for human cancer. In type 5 adenovirus genome, endogenous E1A and E1B promoters drive these genes which are uh, responsible for uh, viral replication. So we replaced endogenous E1A and E1B promoters to HTAT promoter and iris sequence uh, respectively to selectively drive these genes in terminus positive human uh, cancer cells. The resultant virus was termed terminalizing OBP301 in vitro XTT analysis demonstrated that uh, uh, terminalizing infection efficiently kill various types of human cancer cell lines derived from different organs. We also examined the in vivo anti-tumor effect of terminalizing. Mice with palpable human tumors received three daily courses of intratumoral injection of terminalizing. Uh, treatment was uh, uh, associated with a significant tumor uh, reduction. Also, our preclinical studies demonstrated a variety of uh, match functions of uh, terminalizing. Terminalizing can traffic to the regional uh, lymph lymphatic area, including lymph node metastasis. Uh, terminalizing induces immunogenic cell death by stimulating dendritic cells. Uh, terminalizing exhibits anti-angiogenic activities uh, by uh, stimulating tumor microenvironment. Terminalizing induces autophagy through microRNA network. Terminalizing also eliminates uh, CD133 positive human gastric cancer stem cells in three dimensional spheres. 
We also uh, confirm the combination effect of OBP301, thermalizing and uh, ionizing radiation. Uh, when DNA double strand breaks were generated by, uh, by ionizing radiation, uh, mRNA complex consisting of MRE11, NBS1, and RAD50 recognize these breaks and uh, promote a phosphorylation of ATM leading to the DNA repair. At that time, thermalizing is infected. Uh, viral, DNA, viral E1B55KG degrade mRNA complex and inhibit ATM phosphorylation and its downstream responses. Overall, uh, DNA repair blockade leads to radio sensitization. We also uh, examine the anti-tumor effect of thermalizing and radiation in an orthotopic human uh, esophageal cancer xenograft. Esophageal tumors were intratumorally injected with thermalizing immediately following radiation. This treatment was repeated three times every two days. The non-invasive uh, imaging system, IBIS, uh, demonstrated that intratumoral injection of thermalizing alone or radiation alone uh, shows a significant uh, reduction of tumor growth. However, uh, the combination shows a more profound anti-tumor effect. We also found that uh, after intratumoral injection of GFP express expressing thermalizing into rectal tumors, also topically implanted into nude mice, the optical imaging of the abdominal cavity demonstrated the viral spread into the regional lymphatic area. We also uh, confirmed that virus uh, could traffic to regional uh, neck lymph nodes in an orthotopic head and neck tumor xenograft. Uh, in the clinical situation, intratumorally injected uh, uh, thermalizing can replicate and uh, spread into the regional area, suggesting that thermalizing and uh, radiation uh, have the same treatment field, including local regional uh, lymph nodes. Uh, based on these promising preclinical uh, data, uh, we proposed an open label phase one dose escalation study of OBP301 thermalizing in combination with radiotherapy. Uh, patients with esophageal cancer uh, who uh, perform effective standard therapies such as radical surgery or definitive chemoradiotherapy were not are available uh, due to the old age or prevalence of frailty are eligible. Uh, there are three uh, levels of thermalizing doses, 10 to, the 10, uh, 10, 10 to the 10th virus particles to 10 to the 12th PP. The primary endpoint was safety incidence of those limiting toxicities. Second end, end point, secondary endpoints were objective response rate, progression-free survival, and overall survival. Patients with esophageal cancer uh, receive endoscopic intratumoral injection of thermalizing on day 1, 18, and 32 uh, during the conventional 60 gray uh, radiotherapy starting on day 4. The GMP grade thermalizing bias were imported from the US after an original solution was diluted to the indicated concentration at the CPC, the syringe it was moved to the uh, treatment room on ice. Then, thermalizing was endoscopically injected. Uh, this is a summary of all patients enrolled into the study. Uh, we have treated 13 patients with the escalation doses of thermalizing. All patients had uh, squamous cell carcinoma uh, with an age uh, from uh, 53 to 92 years old. Uh, here is a uh, reason why they cannot be a candidate for, uh, for surgery or uh, uh, chemoradiotherapy. Most of them are high age and uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, we have treated uh, six patients with a stage one and five patients with stage two or three. Uh, this is a summary of adverse events in all cohorts. The most frequently uh, occurring AEs were fever, esophagitis, GI disorder, uh, lymphocytopenia, uh, leukocytopenia, lymphocytopenia, anorexia, and pneumonitis. Esophagitis and pneumonitis may be due to radiotherapy. All patients had uh, a transient lymphocytopenia. Uh, two of them uh, show the grade four uh, lymphocytopenia, uh, although they do not have any uh, clinical symptoms. So we revised the protocol 
that uh, uh, great Paul or lymphocyte penia is not recognized as a, a severe adverse event unless patients have, uh, have the clinical symptoms. This is a, a time course of lymphocyte count. All patients show transient lymphocyte penia. We speculate that uh, tremorizing induced a rapid uh, decrease of lymphocyte, uh, lymphocyte count just after intratumoral injection, or uh, maybe next day, and, but the gradual decrease of uh, lymphocyte count is due to uh, radiotherapy. So in the current protocol, uh, radiotherapy is not stopped unless the patients show uh, some clinical symptoms. Uh, systemic dissemination of tremorizing was also evaluated by correction of patient plasma, sputum, uh, saliva, and urine. Uh, QPCR analysis was carried out uh, to detect the circulating DNA. Uh, tremorizing DNA could be detected uh, we, uh, within 30 minutes after intratumoral injection uh, in, level, in level two and three but not in level one, uh, suggesting that the systemic shedding of tremorizing is dose dependent. Uh, no viral DNA was detected at 24 hours after uh, treatment, indicating that the, this event is just transient. To monitor the systemic immunological activity against tremorizing, we determine the neutralizing antibody titer for adenovirus. All patients showed the increase of titers 19 days after first injection of tremorizing. However, the magnitude of titer increase did not correlate with doses of tremorizing. This is a summary of clinical responses in 13 patients enrolled into this study. Objective responses were CR in eight patients. All of them exhibited uh, uh, no viable uh, malignant cells in biopsy specimens. Case three, uh, case three had uh, uh, endoscopic tumor reduction, uh, resulting in the reopening of the asparagus. Uh, AIDS patients uh, had also uh, tumor uh, partial tumor reduction, so, and the residual tumor uh, could be removed by endoscopic submucosal dissection. Uh, seventh patient is a 53-year-old female uh, with advanced uh, esophageal carcinoma. Uh, she had a severe dysfun uh, liver dysfunction, so uh, cannot be a candidate for uh, chemotherapy. Intratumoral injection of tremorizing induced uh, a massive ulceration and reduction of the tumor. At the time of third injection, tumor almost, uh, almost disappeared. And uh, one month and three months after treatment, uh, biopsy uh, demonstrated that uh, uh, there was no uh, viable mar malignant cells. Uh, she's still alive for more than four years without any uh, recurrence. We also evaluated the therapeutic effect on lymph node metastasis. The PET scan uh, demonstrated increase, uh, increased FDA uptake in primary as well as uh, uh, neck lymph node, suggesting the neck li uh, uh, lymph node metastasis. Uh, however, uh, both primary tumor and metastatic lymph node become negative eight months after uh, treatment. The coronal section shows the same uh, findings. Therefore, uh, tremorizing plus radiotherapy is also effective for lymph node metastasis. The 12 patient was an uh, 82 year old male uh, with esophageal adenocarcinoma. Uh, he had a severe cardiovascular disease and was, uh, was enrolled into this study. Also, tremorizing injection induced apparent tumor reduction, and uh, uh, at the time of third injection, uh, there was no tumor. And uh, uh, three months after uh, treatment, a uh, biopsy uh, specimen showed that uh, there was no viable uh, malignant cells. Uh, the swim approach demonstrated that the prolonged duration of the responses could be expected once patients uh, showed clinical uh, CR, although the death uh, due to other disease was frequently observed for elderly patients. Uh, four patients are still alive, and four, four patients died due to uh, other disease, such as uh, COPD and Parkinson's disease, and three patients uh, 
shows uh, uh, three patients died uh, due to metastasis, distant metastasis, also uh, there was no uh, recurrence in the primary site. So this is a dose escalation schedule of the study. As the third patient showed uh, uh, grade four lymphocytopenia, we had we added three three more patients, and the fifth patient was withdrawn uh, because of uh, PD during the treatment. So we added one more patient. Uh, we treated seven patients in um, level one, and also uh, we treated the three patients in level two and three. Uh, in level three. Uh, six patients were scheduled uh, for the treatment, but uh, uh, with uh, Oncolis Biopharma, company-sponsored clinical trial uh, started, so uh, we moved to uh, uh, company-sponsored clinical trial, and we have already treated five patients. Uh, with one more patient, we can finish the phase one trial, and uh, move to, we can move to phase two trial. So in summary, Multiple doses of OBP301 terminalizing was well tolerated. Most adverse events were mild to moderate. Uh, transient lymphocytopenia was seen in all patients. Pharmacokinetic data demonstrated that uh, uh, viral DNA could not be detected in sputum, saliva, and urine. But uh, uh, viral DNA could be transiently detected in the plasma at levels two and three. A systemic viral shedding into the blood circulation was dose dependent. Tumor reduction was observed in 11 out of 12 evaluable patients, eight clinical CR and three PR. So objective response rate was 91.7%. Uh, clinical complete response rate was 83.3% in stage one and 60% in stage two or three. As a reference, uh, Japanese, uh, Japan Espadial Society data demonstrated that clinical CR rate by radiation alone was 56.7% uh, and 26.8% uh, for stage one and two, three, uh, respectively, respectively, suggesting that there are some additional effect of terminalizing. Checkpoint inhibitor-based immunotherapies have achieved impressive success in cancer therapy. However, only a subset of patients derived clinical benefit. A variety of uh, combination clinical trials are underway with chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and also oncolytic viruses. Immune checkpoint inhibitors are known to work best against so-called hot tumors uh, with infiltrating immune cells such as CD8 positive cells. Also, PDL1 expression is a FDA-approved approved companion diagnostics for anti-PD1 therapy. So uh, our uh, preclinical studies uh, demonstrated that viral infection uh, increased PDL1 expression in a dose-dependent manner uh, in various types of murine uh, tumor cells. Uh, histopathological immunohistochemical analysis demonstrated that uh, uh, massive infiltration of CD8 positive cells in partially responded tumors. Uh, we also found that terminalizing injection induced PDL1 upregulation in biopsy specimens, suggesting that terminalizing induced cell death may be highly immunogenic. So in conclusion, uh, multiple causes of endoscopic OBP301 terminalizing injection with radiotherapy were feasible and provided definite clinical benefits in patients with esophageal cancer, especially who are unfit for standard treatment such as surgery and uh, uh, chemoradiotherapy. I want to finish my talk today. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fujiwara. And to discuss this last presentation is Dr. Q from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Okay, thank you very much to the uh, organizers for inviting me to discuss this very interesting study. Thank you also, um, con sorry, my congratulations also to Dr. Fujiwara and his group for uh, conducting this um, innovative um, experimental study. Um, I think my, disclosure, my disclosures flash by, but I do want to point out that I have research funding from Onkelis for an investigator-initiated study that I'll discuss in the next several slides. Um, so Dr. Fujiwara very eloquently and concisely discuss the preclinical rationale for OBB301 
and also presented early phase one data. Therefore, in the next 10 minutes, I'll talk about what the implications for this are and where can we go with these phase one data, especially in terms of clinical trial development here in the US. So by way of background, and just to emphasize, esophageal gastric cancer globally is a huge problem, and we see almost 1.4 million patients per year with this cancer diagnosis. That's actually individually more than either lung or breast cancer. Clearly, there's great, incident, there's great variation in the incidence in different parts of the world. It's much more common in China, East Asia, and the Middle East than it is here in the US. But unfortunately, irrespective of where it occurs, this is a difficult disease to treat with a case fatality rate that approaches 75%. As mentioned, the two, the two histologies we see in the esophagus are squamous cell carcinoma as well as adenocarcinomas. In the US, in comparison to East Asia, adenocarcinomas actually are the dominant histology and comprise approximately three quarters of tumors. On the other hand, in countries where this cancer is endemic, endemic it's the squamous cell cancers that predominate. So in Dr. Fujiwara's study of 13 patients, uh, 12 patients had squamous cell cancers, while only one had an adenocarcinoma. The, uh, this is a cartoon from the TCGA analysis, and you'll see on the right that squamous cell cancers and adenocarcinomas are molecularly completely different. Uh, squamous cell cancers arise because of smoking and alcohol abuse, whereas adenocarcinomas overwhelmingly are related to reflux. But you'll see also on the left that squamous cell cancers arise in the proximal two-thirds of the esophagus, while in the distal third in GE junction we find adenocarcinomas. So where do we go with these phase one data? So as Dr. Fujiwara mentioned, in addition to potentially potent local tumor effects, OBP301 may also sensitize cells both to radiation and may also potentiate immune responses. Therefore, potential experimental approaches would include combining OBP301 with chemotherapy, with chemotherapy and radiation, with immunotherapy, and as well as all of the above. So the first potential combinatorial strategy I'll talk about is OBP301 in combination with chemoradiation. This also requires a little bit more background. So here in the US, definitive chemoradiation is typically the standard of care for patients who have locally advanced esophageal cancers who are medically inoperable because of comorbidities. Uh, we try very much to, uh, to avoid treating patients with single agent, radi single modality radiation. And this is based on a pivotal study, the RTOG8501 study, which was published in the early 1990s, and established that chemoradiation was clearly superior to radiation alone. In comparison, in Japan, radiation alone is an accepted treatment modality, and that was the basis for Dr. Fujiwara's study. So in this context, there really has been relatively little research. So the only other randomized study after RTOG8501 was also performed by the RTOG group and this was the 0436 study. This study randomized almost 350 patients to a contemporary chemotherapy regimen with radiation, with or without cetuximab, which is an antibody against epidermal growth factor receptor. So this study found no benefit for cetuximab, but it did establish that the clinical complete response rate, in other words, de de defined as a negative endoscopy following chemoradiation, was only about 50%, and indeed, at Two, at the two-year mark, the local failure rate was about 50%, which really highlights that this is an area of unmet need in this patient population. So in this context, this is a study that I have proposed and which has been accepted by the NRG Cooperative Group. The NRG is a successor group to RTOG. Uh, this study is currently awaiting NCI evaluation. The study will enroll patients with adenocarcinoma tumors who are medically inoperable because of comorbidities. Uh, and it is a non-operative study. So the design is relatively straightforward. Patients receive one injection of OBP301 via endoscopy before they start standard chemoradiation. The chemotherapy regimen here is carboplatin pacotaxol, which is considered a contemporary standard of care regimen. Um, along the way, they receive two additional injections of OBP301 during the chemoradiation period. The reason for starting with OBP301 prior to radiation is that, again, OBP301 may sensitize the tumor cells to radiation, and this in some way parallels the design of Dr. Fujiwara's study, with the exception of the fact, or with the inclusion of, of chemotherapy to radiation. Consistent with the fact that this is a non-operative study, patients undergo restaging prior to observation. This is a small phase one study as well. The primary endpoint is really to demonstrate feasibility, but we will of course be closely looking at the clinical complete response rate. And if that is promising, that would also warrant a large phase two or potentially randomized study. 
The next combinatorial strategy uh, hinted at by Dr. Fujiwara would be to combine OBP301 with immunotherapy. Here I have the data for the two anti-PD-1 antibodies that are approved globally for the treatment of advanced esophageal gastric cancer. The first is nivolumab and the second is pembrolizumab. And, in, and both of these drugs were studied in patients with treatment refractory disease. Patients had to have progressed on at least two chemotherapy regimens to receive either of these antibodies. You'll see that the results are strikingly similar. The response rate is about 12% in an unselected population. The progression-free survival, unfortunately, is low. It's two months. And the median overall survival is also relatively short at five months. But what is encouraging and noteworthy is that the 12-month overall survival rate is about 25% in a treatment refractory population, suggesting that, as with many immunotherapy studies, there is a tail at the end of the curve, that there are a small number of patients who experience durable benefit. Despite these somewhat modest benefits, uh, pembrolizumab was approved about one and a half years ago in the U.S. in this context, and, Japan, and in Japan, nivolumab was approved at about the same time. So in a, related, um, in a related situation, there's certainly strong interest in augmenting and, and strengthening the abscopal effect. And this is an effect that was first observed by my colleagues on the melanoma service at Memorial, who reported it in a patient with melanoma who was receiving ipilimumab and then who received palliative radiation. Uh, she experienced progression on ipilimumab in a painful paraspinal metastasis. She then received palliative radiation to this metastasis and subsequently experienced disease shrinkage in multiple areas outside of the radiation field. And this was termed the abscopal effect. The basis for this is, is as follows. It's presumed that the radiation, in, in this case, induces cell kill. This releases intratumoral antigens, which are then recognized by the activated immune system. And ultimately, the combination of both leads to an enhanced anti-cancer effect. So with regards to OBP301, treatment with OBP301 may result in immunogenic cell death. Uh, Dr. Fujiwara just showed an infiltration of CD8 T cells as well as upregulation of PDL1. It may therefore augment abscopal responses. Therefore, there would be a rationale to combine OBP301 with immunotherapy, and this is a potential study design. We would start with a PD1 or PDL1 inhibitor, following which we would treat patients with OBP301. Of course, the optimal sequence of immunotherapy and local regional therapy remains unknown, but such a design would mimic the anecdotal response in the melanoma patient I just described. Similarly, we do not know how many treatments of OBP301 would be required. One has to balance pragmatism and the feasibility of multiple endoscopic injections versus the desire to induce as much cell kill as possible. Another approach would be to combine all three. Certainly, this is what a medical oncologist would think about. If two is good, three must be better. In this particular, in this, at this point, there are preliminary data, both from Memorial as well as Johns Hopkins, that it's feasible and safe to add an immunotherapy agent, an immune checkpoint inhibitor, to chemoradiation. So therefore, if initial studies of OBP301 with chemoradiation or OBP301 with immunotherapy show tolerability, we could then consider combining all three together. Again, this study schema is similar to the NRG proposal that I just showed you, with the exception of the fact that during radiation, patients would receive concurrent chemotherapy as well as an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Finally, the last possible clinical experimental scenario would be to take away the radiation, but consider treating patients in the stage four metastatic setting. So at this time, for patients with stage four disease, there are two studies that are ongoing, which are evaluating the addition of an anti-PD-1 antibody to first-line chemotherapy. If either of these studies is positive, it would change the paradigm uh, and therapy of advanced esophageal gastric cancer, but at the same time would also be justification to add OBP301. Again, this is a similar study design to what I presented before, except in addition to PD-1 antibody on its own, we would also add chemotherapy followed by several treatments with OBP301. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So thank you again, and thank you for your attention. This concludes our session. Thank you again.